Good morning and welcome. Welcome to you all. Um, I'm Fred Kemp, President and CEO of the Atlantic Council. Uh, next week, uh, President Obama will meet with Gulf Cooperation Council heads of state at a historic uh, summit at Camp David. Uh, this meeting comes, uh, we use the term critical juncture pretty often, um, but I think that's an understatement. Uh, the Middle East is besieged by uh, security threats, the Houthi rebellion in Yemen, continued turmoil in Libya, proliferation of extremist groups like ISIS, among others, breakdown of states, uh, enhanced cooperation among the United States and its Gulf partners is crucial to answering these threats and to bolster Middle East stability. As the P5 plus one countries in Iran work to finalize a comprehensive nuclear deal by June 30th, uh, the likes of which could significantly alter the security landscape of the region, Gulf partners are concerned not only with Iran's nuclear ambitions, but in many cases uh, they feel more importantly with its regional ambitions, with its hostile activities, and with the sponsorship of belligerent proxy groups. So this isn't just uh, a discussion about uh, the, the nuclear agreement and a response to it, but more a response overall to Iran in the region, and I think Camp David will also focus on that. He'll have to convince Gulf leaders, President Obama will have to convince Gulf leaders next week that the Iran deal is in the region's best interest. He must reassure them that such a deal would not come at the cost of decades old US partnership with GCC countries. That's no small task. At the core of successful nuclear negotiations as well as stabilizing the region at large is cooperation by the US and its Gulf partners. To help foster uh, such cooperation, the Atlantic Council has undertaken multiple efforts to address key strategic issues confronting the Middle East and Americans' role in that region, even as our Iran uh, task force at the Atlantic Council works on the other dimension of, uh, of, of this uh, situation. The Scowcroft Center, under the leadership of Vice President of the Atlantic Council and Director Barry Pavel, has spearheaded a major initiative over the course of 2014-2015 on Gulf and Middle East security after a potential Iran nuclear deal, engaging stakeholders on issues such as upgrading U.S. defense strategy and force posture in the Gulf, uh, and uh, emerging and disruptive technologies in the region, and other issues. Most recently, Barry and a senior fellow in the Scowcroft Center, uh, Bill Al Saab, issued a report entitled, quote, Artful Balance, Future U.S. Defense Strategy and Force Posture in the Gulf. Uh, I recommend you all take a look at that. It's on AtlanticCouncil.org. It proposed a formal mutual defense treaty with willing Arab Gulf states, a major upgrade to the security agreement between the U.S. and its Gulf partners. Uh, the Council and its Rafi Kariri Center for the Middle East has also launched the Middle East Strategy Task Force, co-chaired by Madeleine Albright and Stephen Hadley, uh, bipartisan co-chairs, to bring together a broad array of regional stakeholders and international experts uh, to collaborate in identifying ways uh, in which the people of the Middle East can build and support governing institutions that offer legitimacy, opportunity, and an alternative to violence. Um, so at this point, I'm honored to uh, introduce and then uh, also welcome, as I uh, introduce them, five dynamic uh, experts to the Atlantic Council uh, uh, to the Atlantic Council stage today. Uh, His Excellency Yusuf Al Taiba, Ambassador of the United Arab Emirates to the United States. It's hard to overstate the ambassador's contributions to bilateral U.S.-U.A.E. relationship during his seven-year tenure in his current post. Ambassador al Taiba has increased the military intelligence and counterterrorism cooperation between the two countries. Uh, and I think uh, Mr. Ambassador involved in six um, uh, coalitions with the United States over the last 20 years, and, and, and so this is also action on the ground. Uh, and also facilitated the landmark U.S.-U.A.E. Agreement for Peaceful Civilian Nuclear Energy Cooperation. Uh, the only place where I think we've had uh, consistent disagreement with the ambassador is over the importance of rooting for Manchester City as a soccer team. Uh, 
Um, uh, joining the ambassador for this important discussion are the Honorable Derek Chalet, former Assistant Secretary of Defense for International Security Affairs, who has recently joined the think tank community as a counselor and senior advisor for security and defense at the German Marshall Fund. Ellen Leipson, President and CEO of the Stimson Center, who joined Stimson in 2002 uh, after 25 years of government service, including as Vice Chair of the National Intelligence Council and on the State Department's policy planning staff. And also Ambassador Martin Indyk, who has had an illustrious diplomatic career, including most recently as U.S. Special Envoy for Israel-Palestinian uh, negotiations, and he's now as Executive Vice President of Brookings. Uh, finally, our moderator for today's discussion is Karen DeYoung, Associate Editor and Senior National uh, Security Correspondent for the Washington Post. She's been at the uh, Post for three decades, uh, serving as Bureau Chief and Correspondent covering the White House, uh, U.S. Foreign Policy and Intelligence Community, uh, and has a number of awards to her credit, uh, including the 2003 Weintal Award for Diplomatic Reporting, Sigma Delta Chi Awards, uh, and a Pulitzer Prize she shared with several Washington Post colleagues for national coverage of the war on terrorism. So Karen, it's great to have you leading this panel. I'd like to invite you and all your panelists to, uh, to the podium. Are we, are we on? Yes. Thank you, Fred. And, and I'm so glad to see such an such a illustrious and large audience for what, as, as Fred said, is a very, very important discussion, very timely. And I couldn't think of a better panel uh, to have to, to talk about this issue. Uh, so we'll go get right into it. Uh, hopefully, we can have a discussion. I'll ask some questions. And then at some point, we'll, we'll turn to you for your questions. Um, we all remember that when this summit was announced, it was uh, in the remarks that the president made about the achievement of the framework deal uh, with Iran. And uh, it's clear that these are issues that are very closely tied together. Um, the president said he'd spoken to King Salman in Riyadh and said he was inviting the six GCC countries to Camp David quote, to discuss how we can further strengthen our security cooperation while resolving the multiple conflicts that have caused so much hardship and instability throughout the Middle East. So obviously, that was a pretty broad agenda. Uh, this week, the GCC uh, heads of state had their own summit uh, in preparation for the meeting with the president and released a communique yesterday in which they said that the talks uh, should contribute to strengthen close relations with the United States in light of current developments and events and to enhance the security and stability of the region. Um, obviously, those current developments and, and events include the framework arrangement with Iran, uh, negotiations toward a final deal with Iran, and the ongoing conflicts in Syria and Yemen, in addition to the relationship between the GCC and the United States. So, uh, Mr. Ambassador, I'd like to start with you. Um, what, what's on the agenda as far as the GCC is concerned? What would constitute a successful meeting? I think we are approaching the Camp David summit as an opportunity. Um, Martin knows that we've, we've considered this idea and debated this idea for a long time, and not just now. Uh, we first made the suggestion of having a U.S. GCC summit approximately four years ago. I think it's imperative that we have not one now, given the circumstances of the area and what the region is going through. But I would look at it as this is an opportunity for us to strengthen the U.S. GCC relationship. It has been challenging. The GCC is six countries, is often uh, having competing interests. But the fact is, the one thing we don't disagree on is that we all want a strong relationship with the United States. Now, what comes out of Camp David, we will find out soon uh, Secretary Kerry is meeting with the GCC foreign ministers in uh, Paris tomorrow that he plans to roll out what will be the sessions and the discussions and what will be delivered in Camp David, so I don't want to precede that. But we are looking at it as an opportunity to strengthen the relationship. We are not looking at it as uh, 
a result of the nuclear discussions. I want this to be very clear. Camp David is not being set up because there is a nuclear negotiation going on. We think this, the importance of the Camp David summit is uh, important to stress on its own merits. If there were no nuclear discussions going on today, I think Camp David would be equally as important and we would still be advocating for it. So I think you have six countries in the region that are dealing with a very complex environment who are looking to strengthen their relationship with the United States of America. What, what does that mean, though? Does that mean a treaty? Does that mean expanding the countries that have a, have a um, non-NATO status? Uh, does it mean a mutual security pact? What does it, what, what would be? I, I think the label that you give it is not really the issue that I would focus on. I think we are looking for some form of security guarantee, given the behavior of Iran in the region, given the rise of the extremist threat. We definitely want a stronger relationship. In the past, we have survived with a gentleman's agreement with the United States about security. I think today, we need something in writing. We need something institutionalized. And what I hope is that this is the first GCC summit. Uh, we're going to strongly support that this become an annual meeting. Now, whether it happens in the region or happens in Washington, we can figure it out. But I think it's important that this is not a one-off thing. I think this should become an annual meeting. You, Derek, you've, you've most recently been in government and dealing with exactly these issues. From the US perspective, what, what is doable here and what is desirable? Well, I think as, as the ambassador noted, this is uh, a, a further evolution of an effort that has been underway for the past several years to try to further strengthen and create an architecture around the U.S. security relationship with our Gulf partners. We've created various forums over the last several years bringing together ministers, foreign ministers and defense ministers. A year ago, the ambassador and I were in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, for a meeting of the GCC defense ministers with then Secretary of Defense Hagel. That was a US initiative to try to uh, ensure that the, at the defense minister level, there was a structure for deeper uh, conversation around a table. We have, of course, very strong bilateral ties with all of our Gulf partners. And it will be important to emphasize at the Camp David summit that uh, even though we have high aspirations for a regional security architecture, that in no way would supplant the very strong bilateral relations we would have with our Gulf partners. But I think it, it's very important to institutionalize this. And I think, uh, as the ambassador pointed out, having something that, that would meet regularly, perhaps in the region at times, here in the United States and others, along the lines of what we have with partners in Europe, partners in Asia, more regular interactions where we can discuss security issues. This would need to happen even if there were no uh, Iran deal. This is, this is something that we've we believe in, and it's, and it's a policy that, that has been in, in evolving in the last several years. Well, I, both of you have said it needs to happen even without an Iran deal, but the fact is it didn't happen without an Iran deal. <laughs> um, and, and so I wonder, maybe Martin and Ellen, if you could talk a bit about why this has been tough. Uh, you, have, you have six countries that uh, sometimes don't get along with each other, although they seem to be getting along together better lately. Um, and, and that have different uh, ways of looking at, at their world. Uh, Martin, you want to talk a little I bit about I was going to suggest that one. <laughs> Ladies first. Well, I think this tension between bilateral and multilateral is not unique to the Gulf region. Obviously, the six countries share a lot. There are identity issues, uh, you know, familial ties, language, culture, et cetera. Uh, but of course, they are differentiated because they have different national perspectives, in part depending on where they sit geographically. Saudi Arabia obviously has a, a very larger threat perception than others from some of its neighbors. The small Gulf countries that have really thrived in the age of globalization take a different approach to security. Um, and so that's understandable. But for decades, the United States has been encouraging more integration of air defense systems, of various uh, security systems where we see um, you know, economies of scale. We see opportunities to make the relationship more robust and efficient by pooling together some of the core requirements of the security of each of these individual countries. Um, so I think we have to live with this, this tension between each of them having distinct national perspectives and yet also having some shared interests. And I think I, I quite agree with you, Karen, that it was the, the stimulus of their anxiety about the Iran deal that allowed us to sort of find this moment that, uh, that created this new mechanism. 
Um, yeah, it, it was both the nuclear deal and something else that's going on in the region, which is the collapse mm -hmm. of the existing order, the, the rise of, of ISIS, uh, Iran's exploitation of the chaos in the region to uh, pursue its hegemonic ambitions in the Sunni Arab heartland. Uh, all of these things are coming together uh, in a, a circumstance in which the nuclear deal actually becomes the, the immediate uh, reason for the United States uh, and President Obama to act to reassure our Gulf allies. And that's what this summit is about. It's an act of strategic reassurance uh, of our Gulf allies in the context of a, of a dramatically uh, increased sense of threat. Uh, they have existed uh, sitting on all that oil in a very dangerous environment for a very long time. But now the confluence of events uh, has, I think, increased that sense of, of insecurity in a very real way. Uh, you know, if you're Saudi Arabia, you're, you're looking at, at uh, chaos in just about all of your borders and Iranian uh, interventions uh, designed to create, to create uh, problems entirely encircling Saudi Arabia, from, I think, from a Saudi uh, perspective. The nuclear uh, deal is, is in, in that context of an increased sense of insecurity, should, in theory, reduce the sense of insecurity. After all, its purpose, assuming that it's finally done, is to take off the table uh, an Iranian nuclear weapons capability for at least 10 to 15 years. But uh, what comes with that is the lifting of sanctions, the injection of a huge amount of, of unfrozen assets, some say $120 billion that Iran will have once it's implemented its commitments, have access to 20 to $25 billion in additional revenues a year. Uh, and this comes in the context of Iranian behavior in the region, which is very troubling to them, as I already said. And so uh, there's a real question about uh, whether this, this deal, uh, while it takes care of Iran's nuclear weapons ambitions for the medium term, whether it's actually going to increase uh, the sense of insecurity. And that's why the strategic reassurance is necessary. That's why the president has recognized it. And that's why this GCC summit at Camp David with the United States is historic, as, as uh, Fred said in his introduction, and can represent a turning point uh, in terms of uh, what I would be looking for, which is a formal, explicit, defense commitment on the part of the United States um, to the various uh, Gulf states there assembled. And so this, this is not, as you say, not just a nuclear deal. The, the concerns of countries in the region, obviously, and U.S. concern, is over Iran's other activities in the region. Um, and one would expect that there'll be a conversation about that. But how do any of you, and, and you in particular, Yousef, how do you how can Iran be contained um, in terms of what's happening in Syria, what's happening in Yemen, what's happening in, in Lebanon? What kind of agreement do you think would help move things in the direction that you would like to see them go aside from the, from the um, nuclear agreement? Well, that's a good question, and I think that's one of the things we are really looking forward to discussing in Camp David. Uh, let's not forget the United States invented the containment strategy. Uh, back in the Cold War. So I think we're going to come and look at a, a discussion, a brainstorming session about how the GCC countries and the United States together, collectively, can come up with a containment strategy that doesn't put countries at risk, that doesn't threaten countries on the border with our countries. So I, I don't have a solution or an answer, but I think that's a big conversation that we're planning to have at Camp David. Because if you talk to most of the GCC countries, they'll tell you that they are more concerned about Iran's behavior than they are about whether it's 5,000 or 7,000 centrifuges. The, uh, of course, the administration has said that they, they don't see these issues as tied in terms of the 
of the uh, nuclear negotiations, but that they believe that having this issue at least taken care of to a certain extent perhaps could open the door to more talks with Iran over these other issues. Does, does anybody think that that's um, a logical assumption? Uh, is that going to work? I actually think it's the opposite, in the, in the short term <laughs> at least. Uh, because if you look at the logic of, uh, that we've been talking about here, uh, the, the fact that Iran will emerge from this deal with, with capabilities and a standing in the, it's coming out of the cold as a result of this deal. The sanctions will be lifted, or at least suspended, and, and its engagement with the international community will be very different. And because that's happening at the same time as it's engaged in all manner of nefarious activities in the region, uh, the president has to respond to that in order, in effect, to sell the deal. He has to stand up to Iran more forcefully than he would otherwise to show not only the, our Gulf allies, but Israel, uh, Egypt, Jordan, that, that the United States is not going to abandon their interests on the altar of a detente with Iran. That's what they all assume is going to happen. Right. And so the, rather than a kind of grand bargain uh, and a rapprochement between the United States and Iran, I, I actually expect, uh, ironically, the opposite, that there will be great attention. You already see it in the Straits of Hormuz mm -hmm. and, and off uh, the coast of Yemen uh, and, and uh, also in Iraq. Uh, and I think that will, con that will uh, continue, if not even uh, escalate, until such a point as Iran comes to understand that it's not just about its nuclear ambitions. It's about its hegemonic ambitions in the region. And when they come to understand that, then a detente becomes possible. But I think that we're going to have to go through that first uh, period of what Yusuf calls containment before we can get to that. Ellen, both of you. I think we're going to have to be um, a little bit, you know, from those long weeks in Geneva and Lausanne where there was some bonding between American and Iranian ex uh, officials, uh, I don't think the U.S. has the luxury of letting the pendulum swing all the way to the other side and say, aha, but truth be told, we still don't trust the Iranians and here's, we can't identify entirely with the Arab position on this. I think we cannot undermine what was achieved in Switzerland by building a little bit of demonstration of respect and and uh, short of trust, but at least greater understanding. Um, and I think that the US investment is in helping the Iranians gradually shift their net assessment of when is their behavior revolutionary and when is it sort of adapting to global norms and the regional status quo. So I think that we cannot be um, swinging too far from one side of this ledger to another. We have to somehow represent the, the, cal the careful calibration of we are trying to help er bring Iran in from the cold. We're not, going to enjoy, you know, we're not going to embrace their behavior in the region, but we're trying to provide these incentives in a more subtle way. On the Arab side, it may be that they want to say clearly that Iran is the existential threat. I don't think we can associate ourselves entirely with that threat perception. Sure. So I have, I have a little yeah. uh, different view. I, I think um, you know, Martin is right. The pressure on the nuclear deal, whether we judge it successful or not, may actually come from, with, from outside the deal itself, and it's on Iran's behavior in the region, particularly if this is perceived as an opportunity for Iran to open the spigot on all of the concerns we have about its behavior and have been very clear, continue to have about its behavior in the region, whether it's conventional proliferation, support for proxies, uh, what they're doing in Syria and Iraq. Uh, this gets into the capabilities side of the equation, which we've, the United States and our Gulf partners have made great strides over the last several years in ensuring that Gulf partners have significant military capabilities. But there's particular concern on the non-conventional side of the Iranian threat, uh, the irregular warfare side of that threat. That's why we have tried hard, but we have a lot of work to do on things like cyber 
and trying to have better bilateral cooperation on cyber, but also working with the GCC as a whole on cybersecurity, on maritime security. Similarly, as we've seen just in the last week with the Straits, obviously the air and missile the threat threat is something that we've worked on quite a bit. We have a lot of good bilateral efforts, but I think we can do more with the GCC as a whole on the missile defense side. Can I just ask you on that question, the whole question of interoperability and whether um, I think I think it's assumed that as part of whatever comes out of the summit, uh, there will be provision for more defense sales, provision for more interoperability. Um, a lot of the countries in the region um, are not interoperable in terms of in terms of their systems. How likely is that to happen? Are you when you look for what you want to buy? And let's face it, the Americans. Part of the American objective here is to sell more stuff. Um, you know, is that, are you, is, do you see it in that context? And do you see, uh, almost like NATO, a region where everybody, you know, one for all and all for one in terms of the equipment you have, in terms of how you can quickly move together? I'm, I'm not sure the goal is to sell more stuff. If that was the case, I think there'd be a lot of lined up customers ready to go. I think this is a, a strategic conversation about balance, about interoperability, about capability, and about how to solve issues that we have not been able to solve yet, like Syria. Um, on the defense side, I think we all should expect more interoperability. But this interoperability has to be a long-term plan. Mm -hmm. That's not going to come out of one meeting for one day in Camp David. Uh, first, we need to implement a kind of vision for a regional security architecture. You're seeing the Gulf countries today operate in two theaters, in the anti-ISIS coalition and in the Yemen operation. That has never happened before, mm -hmm. that Gulf countries are militarily deployed in two places at the same time. So I think we are living in a new world. Um, that new world has now to be matched with what our defense needs are. So I think that's a conversation. It's not a secret that the foreign military sales process here is incredibly frustrating. One of the things that we would need uh, to address is, in a, in a moment like this where we are deployed in two different theaters, how fast can you respond to our needs? How fast can you respond if we are in the same coalition? Um, these are things that have been frustrating us for a long time. And as Fred mentioned, the UAE has fought in six wars with the United States, six. So that deserves some kind of recognition and some kind of process I'm not sure if that's exactly the same process as someone who did not fight in six wars. So I think these are the things that we're looking to clear up. What is the system? How do we get evaluated? And how fast or how soon can you address our needs? Then you can have a conversation about how interoperable the GCC is. I think that's the next stage. I wanted to talk a little bit about, about Syria and Yemen and the extent to which you think these are going to be substantive issues uh, at, the, at the summit. There's, there's a lot of difference of opinion among these countries and with the United States about, about Syria. There has been for a long time. To some extent, countries like Saudi Arabia and Qatar have sort of moved out, along with Turkey, um, in, into a more aggressive posture while the Americans are still hanging back. What, how do you envision that conversation going, any of you? And, and what do you think is likely to come out of it? Will there be any, any progress there? I think it's going to be a. Uh a difficult conversation um, because I think President Obama is looking to provide, as I said before, strategic reassurance in the context of the uh, nuclear deal with Iran, but the reassurance that I think many of the GCC leaders uh, will be looking for at Camp David is that we're going to be doing something about uh, Iranian backed uh, efforts by the Assad regime to wreak great destruction on their people. And, and uh, the president, it's no secret, is extremely reluctant uh, to engage on that particular front. And I doubt that that's going to change because of a summit at Camp David. Uh, so I, how, where they come out on this is, is I think, going to be quite important. Uh, but it, it leads to a second point that I would make, although it, it's, it's no relief for, for the people of Syria, um, is that 
the Camp David summit, I think, uh, is, is, as I said, historic and a turning point in terms of the relationships, uh, security relationship between the United States and the GCC. But this is a process uh, that, that I think will be launched that will go into the next president's uh, inbox as well. Uh, because what's involved here is a period of 10 to 15 years in which the nuclear deal will adhere, presume, we assume that, in which uh, a re there's an opportunity to build a regional security architecture of which the, the summit could be the first uh, uh, cornerstone. And, and that's the context in which it becomes the next president's job to fill out that architecture. And that will have to include uh, what to do about Syria. I mean, I think one of the global shifts that we're seeing <clears throat> is greater regional leadership of local conflicts. And I think both Yemen and Syria suggest that there is more capacity, more leadership capacity in the region. Doesn't mean we're going to agree on all the tactics. And we may not even agree on what are desirable outcomes. But if I were setting the agenda for Camp David, I'd expect the GCC side to take the lead on briefing on the regional conflicts uh, and then have the US respond. I mean, I think that's where, where there is a power shift. And um, I think that I hope the GCC feels that you know, they, they are more in command of some of the facts on the ground. Uh, maybe they'll persuade the United States to reconsider its policies. But more importantly, it's a demonstration of their greater capacity to take the initiative themselves. How, I, I hate to make you speak for the administration, but you're the I'm closest fresh enough, we've gotten. Fresh yeah. so how so. likely is that that they're going to persuade the administration to change its mind? Well, I think, first of all, to Ellen's point, the president has already said publicly in his interview with Tom Friedman several weeks ago that we want our Gulf partners to be capable so that they can do some of the things they are doing right now. And of course, we're going to perhaps have differences over tactics and how they may go about that. And Secretary Kerry just today is in Riyadh talking to the Saudis about Yemen. Uh, but I, th I think that's a conversation that the administration very much wants to have with our Gulf partners in terms of how they look at the region and how they're willing to take responsibility for their own neighborhood. Uh, but um, you know, this, the second piece of it, which I think is is extremely important for the, for the president is, of course, to talk about Syria and Iraq. We are engaged militarily in Syria and Iraq. US aircraft are taking off every day, as they have been since last fall, dropping bombs in Syria and Iraq. Our Gulf partners are working with us, in, in particularly in Syria. And that, so we have a lot of work, actually, on the ground work we have to discuss beyond aspirations for what may come in the future. There's a lot that's going on today that we need to talk about. You, um, and I'm going to ask one more question before we t turn it over to all of you. Um, you mentioned Obama's interview with Tom Friedman, and there was one, I thought, very interesting part uh, where Obama said um, that what he wanted to do was to ask the Gulf countries, how can we, or the countries in the region, how can we build your defense capabilities against external threats, but also how can we strengthen the body politic in those countries? so that Sunni youth feel like they've got something other than ISIS to choose from. He said, uh, I think the biggest threats that they face may not come from Iran invading. It's going to be dissatisfaction inside their own countries. That's a tough conversation to have, but it's one that we have to have. Uh, is that a conversation that you welcome at, at the summit? It's a conversation we'd welcome in private. <laughs> <laughs> it's a conversation. Yes, it has to be had, but you can't have a meaningful conversation about that until you've reassured them in terms of the other part of the equation, mm -hmm. which is the external threat. And that has to come first. But the other, you know, what, once that reassurance uh, has been made and there's a greater sense of trust uh, in, in uh, the American intentions, uh, not just vis-a-vis -vis Iran, but also vis-a-vis -vis what might happen internally, uh, that you can start to have that conversation. Is that, is that what you would say, that it's the, the most important thing now is to build up this level of trust, build up a structure uh, for, so we're working together and have a shared definition of threat? Yeah. Again, looking at Camp David as an opportunity to strengthen the relationship, 
if you get sick and you're already frail, you're not going to feel well. But if you have a disagreement when the relationship is built on a very strong foundation and has the commitments and security guarantees and the kind of reassurance and transparency that we're seeking, a disagreement will not affect the overall health of the relationship, whether it's on Syria or on anything else. We have to get that relationship to that level first, and then we can have these types of conversations without anyone being affected positively or negatively. But the fact that we're having this meeting is a great first step. And the fact that everyone's coming and we're going to have an open conversation about how we go from here, how we work together to resolve these challenges, is the right approach. Um, raise your hands. I'll call on you. And if you, I think we have microphones that will come to you. And, and please identify yourself. Um, but some of you already know, yes. <laughs> Oda Aberdeen, I have a question for Yusuf. <laughs> Kerry has been out to the Speak Gulf into the mic. many times. Chuck Hagel was out to the Gulf. <laughs> Oday, hold it in front of your face. OK. <laughs> Ashton Carter was in Kuwait. The Crown Prince of Abu Dhabi was here, I believe, 10 days ago. Mm -hmm. And you had meetings with everybody. Mm -hmm. Now, when the Crown Prince left, was he assured by Obama that the strategic interest needs of the UAE will be met and did the president persuade Mohammed bin Zayed absolutely and that's why he's coming back for the Camp David summit I don't I don't think there's any strategic disalignment I think we are agreed in terms of what we want how we want the region to be the roles that we have I, any disagreements we have are usually tactical and it's very difficult given the level of turmoil that we have today to have these kinds of conversations bilaterally between six countries, especially when the six countries aren't necessarily aligned on every single one issue. So having that conversation collectively when everyone's in the room, like I said, is something we've been advocating for for many years. Again, has nothing to do with the nuclear talks, has nothing to do, I think today it's happening, but back to your question, is because of the level that we're in. You know, when we first proposed it four years ago, it was a good idea, but there was no need for it. It would, have, it would have been a good meeting. It would have had fantastic symbolic vol value. But the region wasn't, didn't look like it does today. Because of the way the region looks, this meeting is very important. And I think there's no issue that's off the table on the agenda. Barbara? Thanks, Karen. Barbara Slavin. Uh, I'm a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council, and I manage an Iran task force here. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, you said you want something written down. Can you be a little bit more explicit? Uh, yeah. One of our other non-resident fellows, Richard LeBaron, wrote a, an interesting piece the other day where he said, the United States should not be providing NATO-like guarantees to countries that don't share the US democratic values. So what would be your response to that? Thank you. I would say a country that doesn't share your democratic values fought with you six times. And uh, I disagree with Richard. I think we are looking for security guarantees because we want this relationship to be stronger. Uh, we're coming here looking for this relationship to be stronger. So I think this is how we're approaching it. I'm, I'm, I disagree with Richard's uh, approach. Um, at the end of the day, a stronger relationship, and not just on the military side, on trade, on investment, on education, on health care. You know, we send our kids to school to study here. We send our patients to come here for medical treatment. We fight wars with you. We still don't share your democratic values, but we are great partners. Um, so I would, I would disagree with the label. Did you, Derek? Yeah, I mean, on the security guarantee question, I, first, I don't think a legal treaty is in the, in the cards anytime soon, uh, uh, number one. Number two, the United States since 1980, January of 1980. Defense treaty. Defense treaty, defense, any sort of NATO Article Five like uh, arrangement. Um, since January 1980, the United States has had a very clear uh, affirmative statement about our vital interests, security interests in the region and our willingness to use all necessary means, including force, to uh, protect those interests. President Obama reiterated that statement in his uh, 2013 UN General Assembly speech. Um, but understanding there, that there's a desire for more. And there may be creative ways to, to do more, you know, whether it's in writing as part of a joint statement, whether 
it, there is some, some mechanism that can be talked about in the event that there is a perceived threat to the region for immediate consultation that we do with, with other alliance partners around the world. I could see that as something that could come out of this. So this gets back to the, the point that Yusuf started with, which is having a, some sort of architecture, security architecture in the region that would play out over many years, as Martin indi indicated. Not something we're not going to see immediately in place after Camp David, but, some, but, but a work plan, presumably, will be announced at Camp David in which uh, ministers and officials and then le eventually leaders will work on for the coming years to fill out what that guarantee, that pledge may look like. Can I just add one thing, to, I'm sorry. just quickly, uh, to this, which is that if you see it, in the context that Derek has spoken about, uh, of building a regional security architecture. Uh, extended deterrence, uh, in other words, a NATO-like nuclear guarantee, uh, I think will be very important. And it's important to, to start that conversation uh, in public as well as uh, in private. Um, because, as President Obama has said in the same interview that Karen referred to, 13, 14, 15 years from now, Iran will be a near nuclear threshold uh, power. And that in itself is going to cause a, a good deal of anxiety. And since the purpose of, of this deal with Iran is to prevent Iran from acquiring nuclear weapons and prevent a nuclear arms race in the region, uh, we need to use that 10 to 15 years to create a regional security architecture that includes a nuclear umbrella for our allies, uh, such that uh, when we get to the end of this agreement, uh, everybody in the region will feel more secure, not less secure. I think formal alliances are sort of a concept of the 20th century when there was a bipolar world and you sort of knew you could agree that for at least decades to come, there was a very specific uh, and very uh, overwhelming threat perception. But I think partnerships is really what we're talking about. And I think there are ways to strengthen and deepen partnerships with enough clarity of here's where we agree. And then you can be silent on the areas where you don't necessarily agree or have similar political systems. Uh, so I do think that we're talking about this new you know, concept of, of strengthening partnerships in ways that are binding on both parties, but a little bit less than a formal treaty alliance. Let's see if we can do two or three questions at a time. And go ahead. And then. Uh... Hi, Mark Kimmett, uh, former Defense and State. Uh, th there's a very interesting nuance that's going on here between what I believe is the defense position on this and what we're hearing. For 10 years, we've had the Gulf Security Dialogue that has been discussing these very issues, counterproliferation, uh, air and missile defense, maritime security. What seems to be different about what's on offer at um, Camp David has been summarily dismissed by Derek, which is this notion of a written security guarantee as Martin has just described. So if I was an Arab nation and I knew that I had everything already on the table through the Gulf Security Dialogue, which has been ongoing for 10 years now, but we're summarily dismissing this notion of a mutual security pact. Why should I show up? Let's, let's take, yes. And then we'll go back around here. Hi, John Hudson with Foreign Policy Magazine. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, I was just hoping you could comment on recent reports that a missile defense shield is going to dominate the Camp David discussions and whether or not uh, this is largely the result of, of a U.S. push for uh, increased Gulf collective security, uh, which, uh, you, as by your remarks, is perhaps is getting ahead of where uh, some of the GCC countries are in being able to trust uh, each other. And one more we'll do here, and then we'll... Arif Ansar from Polytech. Uh, how would the Iran nuclear deal and the Camp David summit help or hinder the Middle East peace process? Thank you. That's a big question. <laughs> uh, well, let, let's, let's talk first about, about Mark's question. Uh, you know, why if there's, and it, it actually sort of goes to the other question too. I mean, 
the nuclear shield thing, I mean, I remember being with Secretary Clinton years ago in the region talking about precisely this thing. It's not a new concept, but in terms of, of uh, not having a written guarantee, uh, a push on a question that's been on the table for a long time, um, why show up? I, I think well, you sort of answered that in the sense that a lot of this has been ad hoc up till now. You would like a structure. Yeah, I mean, in Britain, it could be written in a joint statement. It's just not legally binding. I don't know anyone in this room would want to watch the congressional fight over another treaty on, uh, uh, at this moment. Um, so I think that there are ways, I mean, we, from, starting from Carter Doctrine to now, we've had a pretty clear commitment to Gulf security. Uh, and we've had a military that has had a presence there. Um, but I think that there are ways, given the new context, not just with Iran, but with the region in turmoil, to think about ways to, to use some sort of guarantee uh, to help uh, assuage our Gulf partners' anxieties, and also to show our commitment to the region, which, is, which has been there for 35 years. Uh, how we may do that, as I said, there could be some creative mechanisms that could be offered uh, uh, and, and if we envision what could happen over the next 15 years where we have a more mature architecture of cooperation with our Gulf partners, it's short of an, a treaty alliance that's not NATO, uh, but maybe is more akin to what we have with some of our Asian partners, uh, that, that, that the words in that guarantee, which have been verbalized, but maybe it could be write, written in a joint statement, may have a little more uh, reassurance packed in there. What do you do in a situation like Yemen if you're talking about external threats? And you know, we all saw this week that the, the Houthis started bombing across the border. What, what does that mean in terms of, of a mutual, uh, some kind of mutual defense agreement, if not, it really, if not treaty? It, it depends on the text of the agreement. We don't, we don't know yet. We, we're coming here to discuss these things. But I think it's important to note that if one of the GCC countries is attacked, we will all treat it as an attack on the GCC, and that's why you have 10 countries involved in a coalition in Yemen today. And by the way, a coalition that there is no significant U.S. footprint. Mm -hmm. This is a good thing. We are moving into a world where regional issues are dealt by regional countries with U.S. support, cooperations, intelligence, of course, but there are no U.S. troops involved. There are no U.S. Uh, aircraft flying missions in Yemen. This is an Arab problem being dealt with by Arab countries. This is a very, very good positive development. Um, Do you want to talk about the missile, yeah, missile defense I think question? The, I, I don't think there's going to be any one subject that dominates the talks. We have about 10 hours scheduled talks. We're going to talk about everything from Iran nuclear negotiations to ISIS to um, treaties and so on. So I don't think there'll be any one subject that dominates. On the defense shield, I don't believe there's a single GCC country that doesn't think a defense shield for the region is a good idea, is a bad idea. I think everyone's on board. The challenge has been, how do you turn on a regional missile defense system when different countries are purchasing different equipment and at different paces? How do you link it? How do you get the radars to talk to each other? How do you integrate six different defense uh, systems into one? So I think this is where we've been struggling. It's not that anyone doesn't want it. So we just don't know how to turn it on yet. And the, I'm sorry, I can't. I forgot the Iran question. <laughs> it was a peace process. Yeah. Uh, uh, peace process. Peace process. That's right. Did you right. forget? Yeah. <laughs> was. Uh, look, in the short term, uh, with a, uh, a right-wing uh, government uh, about to be sworn in in Israel, uh, that. Uh, will surely not have as its uh, joint platform amongst the coalition parties a commitment to a two-state uh, solution uh, based on the 67 lines. Uh, you know, I don't think that, that, that uh, we're going to see a kind of inside-out approach in which there's a willingness in the face of uh, growing threats in the region to say, oh, stupid, Obviously, the problem is the Israeli-Palestinian issue, and we need to resolve that, and everything else will be fine. Uh, those days are past. So, uh, I, I, you know, I don't imagine that we're going going to see some uh, uh, response coming from uh, the Israeli-Palestinian uh, dynamic, which the, the hope is that it doesn't get worse, uh, rather than that it's going to lead to negotiations. And the Iran deal is clearly 
a, a preoccupation of Prime Minister Netanyahu and, and uh, he is going to be fully engaged uh, in trying to prevent the deal from going forward uh, over the next uh, few months and that will affect the character of the relationship between the United States and Israel with the United States being the putative uh, mediator, honest broker in, in, in an Israeli-Palestinian negotiation. So let's just say that the, the prospects, independent of, of what else is going on, the prospects for an Israeli-Palestinian deal uh, for the time being are not good. The question is whether there's some kind of outside-in dynamic that can be created as a result of the Iranian nuclear deal. And that arises because uh, Israel and Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states are on the same side when it comes to a real concern about Iran's regional ambitions and Iran's <laughs> nuclear ambitions. Uh, and of course, it's not just Iran, it's also Assad and it's Hezbollah and it's Hamas. And, and uh, so there, there's a real sense of common threat and a real sense of common interest. Can that be parlayed into uh, greater uh, cooperation, first against security threats, and that would be done under the radar, but into a greater sense that uh, if Israel were prepared to move forward on a two-state solution, it, the Arabs uh, in the, of the Gulf and Egypt and Jordan would be willing to play a, a, a more assertive role in helping the Palestinians to make peace. That's a question that might actually em emerge with a positive answer down the road as a result of this strategic alignment in the region, uh, which is something new and something, I think, in strategic terms, fairly profound between Israel, the Gulf Arabs, Egypt, and Jordan. Let's, we've got about five minutes left, so let's do some questions over here, maybe uh, three or four questions in a row, yes. Thank you. Uh, Salman Jalahma from the Embassy of Bahrain. Um, I feel like both sides, the US and the GCC, have come here to answer one primary question, which is, how much do we mean to you? And I think they're both looking for that answer. Um, and the bigger disparity, I guess, between the US and the GCC on the, on the nuclear file is that the US are prioritizing what is important to them, which is across the Atlantic, which is the nuclear file. But for the GCC, they are facing day-to-day -day aggression from Iran. Um, my question is, essentially, do you think that security assurances from uh, the US will suffice, will that rhetoric suffice, even though a few deals were signed, some papers were signed, photo ops were happened, or do you think there needs to be some kind of um, tangible physical response, whether it's in speech, whether it is in a, in a defense agreement against Iran, talking about the hegemonic interest, talking about the day-to-day -day aggression. Do you think that um, the summit would be successful or would the, G the GCC would be appeased without that sticking point? Yes, sir. Just, sorry? Is that, who is the question for? Yeah, I would love to hear from the Gulf Admiral. Okay. Yes, sir. Is there, we have a microphone. Thank you, uh, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, this morning, I'm, I'm, I'm Rafi Danziger, and a consultant to APAC. And my question is that this morning, the Washington Institute published a paper by uh, Mike Eisenstadt, where he argued that the threat from Iran is not conventional. It's mostly proxies, uh, uh, terrorism, etc. And therefore, all the F-16s and the uh, Patriot Pac-3 that have been provided have not really provided security to the Gulf and more F-16s and even F-35s are not going to solve the problem. The problem really is the proxies and the terrorism. So uh, do you think that uh, this is a correct analysis and therefore what would be the answer to deal with that threat? Thank you. And we'll take one, one more. Yes, sir, right there. Alan Kieswitter with the Middle East Institute. Uh, this is a question for Ambassador Oteba, but others may want to comment. Would the GCC welcome a U.S. unilateral nuclear guarantee, as Martin has proposed? So you, we have, um, will you be appeased 
by nice statements, um, whether, whether the kinds of conventional weapons that you've been assembling actually will solve what essentially is a, is a non-conventional threat from proxies. Uh, this is the, the, the ambassador's it. lightning round, I see, as Martin and Derek didn't get <laughs> any in. questions. You guys uh, can jump in any time you want. Let, let me try to do them relatively quickly. I think I would rather avoid prejudging Camp David going in. And again, we're seeing Secretary Kerry tomorrow, the last thing I want to say, you know, here's what we need, and we're not coming in. That's not the right approach. The approach is, let's come here, let's figure out what the problems are, how we can work together to address our needs. I, I, I think the, the point of the meeting is that we're trying to have this conversation. So I, I would avoid saying, here's what we want, or here's what we would consider a failure if we don't get. Uh, the fact that it's happening, the fact that we're having this conversation, is a great first step, and like I said earlier, it should happen on a regular basis. On the military threat question, it's a very good point, and I don't think it's either this or that. I think having F-16s and PAC-3s are equally important as dealing with asymmetric threats. And if you ask our F-16 pilots who are flying missions all over the place today, they'll tell you that the F-16s are very important and quite useful. So it's not either this or that. I think both threats exist. We have to figure out how to deal with both in real time. The nuclear guarantee, I don't know the answer. I honestly don't because I don't know what a nuclear guarantee means. Uh, you know, just saying that you have a nuclear guarantee, then we have to define what the threat is, when that nuclear guarantee comes into play, and what kind of, you know, the devils would be in the details into how and when to use it, just having kind of it thrown out there, does it make me feel any better or worse until I know how it would work? In, in, just in terms of this, the security guarantee and, and are words enough, of course not. That's why the U.S. needs to maintain a strong force presence in the region. Uh, it's been a major effort of the Obama administration to maintain 35,000 some U.S. Uh, military personnel in and around the Gulf. That's while we've been withdrawn from Iraq, while we've been withdrawing from Afghanistan, while we have significant pressures in terms of forced deployment in Asia, and of course uh, adding uh, troops in terms of exercises and rotational deployments to Europe, we have to protect our military footprint in the Gulf from, our, from the budgeteers and others who want uh, those forces to get, go elsewhere. I think Camp David will need to reaffirm that the U.S. is committed to do that into the future. And, and have that be reflected in future defense budgets. It also goes to the U.S. commitment to providing our partners uh, with capabilities, which we have had great success over the last several years in doing so while adhering to uh, Israel's QME and our, and our commitment there. We've been able to provide Gulf partners with billions in assistance. Some of the largest weapon deals in U.S. history have taken place over the last uh, six years. But that that capability needs to evolve. It, it, it's certainly airplanes, and this gets to the, the question on is it asymmetric or, or conventional. It's certainly airplanes, it's certainly pac 3s uh, it's certainly conventional capabilities, but as I suggested earlier, the threat from proxies, the threat from cyber, certainly our military is very focused on that threat in terms of their presence in the Gulf, and our partners are as well. And this is an area where we have to work together. No single, the United States can't solve it alone, our partners can't solve it alone, we have to work together on this. Cyber, it's satellite imagery, it's a whole lot of other needs that are, you know, that don't get the headlines. Right. But this, this is a opportunity to broaden that kind of collaboration yep. across the board. I think we've run out of time. I thank our panelists who have been terrific. And thank you very much.